Okay, cheers. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so my name is Tom Mellon. I'm here from Crypto Econ Lab, and I'm going to talk about Filecoin crypto economics and how it's relevant to Ethereum. Uh, so I'm, I'm coming more from a, a system dynamics pr perspective, the same as the last researcher. So I do a lot of ODs and differential equations and stochastic processes. But this talk will be more of a kind of high level overview. Uh, okay, so the agenda for this talk is I'm going to start off by telling you what Filecoin is and then talk about some of the crypto econ challenges that we face and then move on to saying how these are relevant to Ethereum. First first thing to say though, a slight advertisement, Crypto Econ Lab is hiring. So if you're interested in a data scientist position, research scientist, engineering, uh, product, uh, we need the whole bunch, so come, come work. Um, and just to say a little bit about how we work in Crypto Econ Lab, so we kind of have this iterative uh, process of, of design, validation, deployment and governance. And Crypto Econ touches on all of these things. And we try to take a kind of first principles approach to thinking about uh, crypto economics, so quite similar to the last researcher. So we're, we're not just drawing lines through points and saying, is it going up? We're really trying to think about what's the underlying mechanism. Um, you know, Can we have some kind of differential equations describing competitive equilibria? Can we have a semi-mechanistic model where we're really encoding uh, parts of uh, parts of the protocol, but we're kind of operating on a statistical level, or should we go fully to agent-based models? Uh, okay, so first thing on the agenda, what is Filecoin? Filecoin is a layer one protocol that starts with data. Um, so really, data is front and center in Filecoin um, in a sense that it's not in, in other layer ones. So other layer ones, like Ethereum, of course, you have utility, and this flows from securing the chain. But in, in Filecoin, it's really the other way around, almost. Uh, it's storing information is front and center, uh, and, and this is used to, to create the consensus mechanism which secures the chain, and fr from this flows other utilities as well, but it's really data that's front and center. So um, in terms of what Filecoin looks like, you, you can think of it as a multi-sided marketplace, or you can think of it, uh, a good way to think about it is as an uh, island economy. So you have these these different actors, and they can exchange services uh, for, for the Filecoin token. And the, the island economy can interact, of course, with economies outside. Uh, but it's more or less self-contained. Um, or an, another good analogy as well is, I think, the... Uh, to, uh, to consider it as an Airbnb for cloud services. So Airbnb, you have some, uh, you have a flat in London, say, and you can, you're not using it, so you can rent it out. Uh, similar idea with um, with Filecoin. You have disk storage, and you can uh, rent that out uh, in exchange for rewards. Uh, and then the last part of Falcon, uh, there is a passionate research, engineering, and product community, and that's, that's an important part of it. So in terms of the different stakeholders in Filecoin, uh, you have storage miners. Storage miners uh, have the chance to win block rewards in proportion to the amount of storage that they provide. And the storage uh, providers interact with clients uh, to to make deals to store data. Um, another central player in this this ecosystem is, are the developers. So there are thousands of developers now working on Filecoin, um, and also you have token holders who can stake their Filecoin in order to bring more value to the project, which helps uh, make storage um, more rewarding and, and bring more utility to the project. Uh, a, a little bit more context, so you can see where Filecoin sits in comparison to other uh, Web3 uh, storage projects. So it's it's somewhat larger, but uh, significantly it's also much, much more cost effective. But the key thing really is not comparing it to other Web3 projects, it's comparing it to something like AWS. So it's still substantially smaller, maybe around 12 times smaller in, in terms of total storage capacity, but it is catching up pretty quick and it is massively um, massively cheaper 
and I, I think there's also kind of more fundamental advantages as well. Um, I mean, you, you can say, okay, we're competing with AWS, but it's not even that. I mean, it, it's just a fundamentally different way of doing things. The AWS model is based essentially on, on this kind of information asymmetry, where people don't really know what they're getting into. Sure, you can put your data in, but you can't necessarily easily get it out. Um, whereas with Filecoin, everything is, is crystal clear, everything's in the code, everything's open and transparent, so it's just a, a fundamentally different way of doing things. Network fees, okay, we'll come back to this in a minute, but this is just a sneak preview of some of the things we're gonna talk about. Okay, so Filecoin crypto econ challenges. So I've already mentioned you can think of it in terms of an island economy, and the state of this island economy at the minute is that there's about 16 ebibytes of storage capacity, which is quite large, around 10,000 developers and 4,000 storage miners. So it's quite a substantial ecosystem. And in order to manage this, you've got to think about, okay, what, what kind of economic levers do we have and what dimensions can we change things along, potentially? So the key, the key, uh, the key different dimensions are the block reward policy, the collateral policy, slashing policy, and gas policy. So, Let's have a look at some of these in a little bit more detail. So in Filecoin, uh, we have sure we, we have this a s sort of simple block reward mechanism, the standard exponential decay. But uh, this is also combined with a second mechanism um, called uh, baseline minting. Uh, so simple minting is, is very good if you want to bootstrap a project. It gives a lot of reward to early participants, but that's not necessarily exactly what you want if you want something to have very long-term utility. So Filecoin has this baseline minting component as well that changes the rate at which rewards uh, can be won. Um, yeah, uh, so it, it effectively, it, it, it doesn't contribute much at the very start, but if it's growing, it, it tries to balance rewards more in line with utility. So if it's growing a lot, uh, more rewards will be emitted, but whenever the network becomes very large, it will slow down again. So you have this kind of dynamic response in the block rewards that you can see here. So that, that's one thing that we have to consider. Another thing is the collateral policy. Um, so. I mean, well, w w one thing just to say to start off with is that the amount of collateral that's locked is, is relatively large. So you can see, I think it's around about 100 million fill at the minute, which puts it like easily within the um, top five compared to DeFi protocols in terms of TVL. But w what is the actual policy uh, that this collateral must satisfy? Um, so whenever my uh, storage providers put up collateral, um, there's different components to this. So there's a consensus pledge, which is equal to 20 days of block reward. And there's a kind of balance here in the block reward um, pledge. Uh, so it, it has to be sufficiently small so as not to deter people from becoming um, storage miners, but it also has to be sufficiently large that uh, you know during the first week, uh, if, they, if they don't reliably store um, data, then they will get slashed sufficiently to deter them from doing this. So there's kind of balance there, and this is the kind of thing that we try to find through doing a lot of simulation. And another component to the collateral model is that the collateral should be somehow related to the amount of circulating supply. So this is where the um, the, uh, the storage pledge comes in as well. So there's, there's two components to the collateral that storage providers have to pay in order to um, use the network. So uh, another interesting part of the policy is the slashing policy. So this is the other side of collateral. Um, so you've got block block rewards, which are the carrot, and slashing, which is the stick. Um, if you don't, uh, if you if you misbehave, essentially. But there's a very delicate balance here. Um, so I in general, storage providers have to to uh, post to the network every 24 hours to prove that they're still storing the data. And if they don't do this, if they have a faulted sector, then they'll get slashed uh, two, two days worth of block rewards. Um, but the thing is, even good miners can have problems. There's always problems with infrastructure. There can be uh, disk failure, this kind of thing. So you've, you've, you've got another delicate balance here. So you have to, you have to balance uh, giving clients sufficient, um, sufficient, sufficiently reliable data uh, compared to uh, 
not unnecessarily slashing good miners. So, so there's a little bit of a slack in the system here as well. And, and the amount of slack is that, okay, you, you, you have to pay for it every day that you're faulted, but at the start you get uh, two days. So if you miss the first one, that's, that's fine. Uh, and this is something, again, that's been, that's been v validated uh, through a lot of simulation. So in terms of gas policy, um, I think Filecoin had a bit of an advantage in that it, it hasn't been on mainnet for such a long time. Uh, it's only a bit over a year. So it, we were able to implement a variant of EIP uh, 1559 pretty uh, from the start, essentially. Um, and th this sort of satisfied a lot of the things that we were looking for in, in Filecoin. It, it reduces the DDoS possibilities. Uh, it, it provides a kind of whole network reward through burning for network usage. Um, and and, and it also regulates volatility as well, which is quite helpful, um, kind of ex exchanging block space for, for price. Uh, so, so these are good things. There's also a couple of variations. Uh, there's also an overestimate estimation pen penalty. This is quite specific to Filecoin. Um, and then there's also a, a batching dynamics element, which I'm going to talk more about, um, which is a variant that we've implemented that might be of interest. Um, OK, so, so whenever we make changes to the crypto economics of Filecoin, the way that we do it is that we propose a FIP similar to an e EIP proposal. And anybody can do this. Um, and our, our kind of proce uh, process for assessing them within our group is uh, first have a smell test. If it doesn't look good, send it back and say, are you, are you really sure about this? If, it, if it's OK, then we can, we'll can uh, assess the impact surface of the change. If it's changing really fundamental things, like block rewards or collateral, then we'll think, hmm, OK, we really have to assess the risk of making this change, and, and is the reward sufficient? And then we'll go on to kind of analytic analysis, a lot of pen and paper maths. And then finally, if, if it's something really big that's going to be yeah, multiple months, maybe a year, in uh, you know, a substantial change to, the, to how the protocol will operate and the economics of the protocol, then we will em embark on a whole modeling and simula simulation run. So this is something we're doing at the minute, for example, for hierarchical consensus, which is a new scaling solution that's coming to Filecoin. And this is going to change, I think, quite substantially how we consider things like gas. Um, OK. And another uh, aspect I just wanted to mention quickly is network uh, analytics and governance. So, you, so if you want to know the economic state of your system, you have to be able to visualize the data simply and easily in a, in a kind of in a handy way. And this is actually not so easy to be able to pull this chain data uh, regularly um, and be able to analyze circulating supply and gas um, and, and the storage state. And another thing we've been looking into, which is kind of related to governance, is giving reputation scores uh, to miners based on data that's pulled from the chain. Uh, so the governance this feeds into DAOs and, and how resources in the network, uh, such as data cap. So data cap is a resource that miners can have for um, the, the miners can have if if they are providing high utility storage, so useful storage, provably useful storage, and this is administer, administered uh, effectively through a DAO, through a so social layer, uh, who decide whether or not this data is useful, and whether or not those miners can earn the, the high level of rewards that uh, storage providers get for more useful data. OK. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is Hyperdrive as a case study. So this was one of the changes that came through um, about a, a year ago in, in on how the, um, the network operates. and it, uh, had the potential to substantially affect the, uh, the the economics, specifically in terms of gas. So, uh, hyper hyperdrive was a change that affects um, that allowed batching of messages on the chain, um, and, and this was enabled by uh, some research that was done on CK Snarks, some new research on that side, on the cryptographic side, by one of the teams at Protocol Labs. And this meant that whenever miners were posting their proofs to the chain, they could es effectively batch those messages and include many, many, many more together. So this effectively 
uh, changes the the kind of congestion dynamics quite a lot. Um, so so this had been something that was really throttling the growth of the network because for a long time we'd we'd had uh, you know, essentially full block space and high base fees. Um, because in order to prove that miners are storing data on, on the network, they have to they post these proofs, uh, but they weren't able to do this sufficiently quickly due to lack of block space. So this uh, uh, ZK Snark um, change made a big difference. But the things that we have to consider are: is this is it fair to the miners now? Because we're kind of in this situation where um, is the gas cost still proportional to the storage? if you can aggregate together lots of proofs and lots of messages? Uh, not necessarily so. Um, and another thing that you have to consider is, OK, so if you can aggregate together lots of messages, then you're kind of in this low congestion regime. So perhaps this makes the network uh, susceptible to things like uh, base fee spiking attacks. Um, so it, it, in order to assess this, this was so slightly before my time, but uh, this this was uh, done in FIP 13, and the economic changes were to, OK, so if you batch the messages, you'll get a heavy discount in terms of the fee, but you'll also have to uh, provide an additional gas fee. And you can see the kind of effects of this here uh, as it played out in terms of the unit economics. So if the base fee was very small, then it was favorable just to uh, to, to post one proof at a time. But if the base fee rose up, then the unit economics change, and it becomes more favorable to post uh, multiple proofs simultaneously aggregated, and even more so as the base fee goes up. Um, and you can see the effect of this in terms of the base fee uh, in, this, in this image. Um, so you can see prior to about June 2021, whenever Hyperdrive came in, there was a lot of congestion on the network. There was a lot of volatility. Then this new construction came in with FIB 13, uh, with Hyperdrive and the new gas model, um, with uh, a, a, a much cheaper fees through aggregation, but also um, a, a fee for aggregating. Um, and, and you can see that after about June 2021, uh, you, you have lower fees overall, but also more stable. And you, and you can see what's happened in terms of the, the, the growth of storage on the network during this time. So uh, as soon as the new gas model came in with the aggregation and hyperdrive, uh, storage onboarding essentially, all, all this throttling and building up and demand that, uh, that had been happening, this was released, and there was a quite substantial growth in this, uh, storage onboarding. And similarly, you can see the, the, the gas uh, base fee variations during this time. So even though the storage onboarding went massively up after June 2021, the, the base fee variations stayed relatively low and stable. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is some features that are relevant to Ethereum. So one thing is scaling solutions. Um, uh, and this is something we've touched on a little bit already with uh, aggregating of messages um, and something we've had to deal with in Filecoin, but it's also th something that's very much coming along soon. So we have this hierarchical consensus scaling solution in Ethereum, and we, we expect that this is going to be ready pretty soon. And this is going to totally shift things uh, e even more into the low congestion regime. So we're, we're questioning at the minute, what is the appropriate gas model for this? Should we be moving away from 1559? Um, and so we're, we're kind of really taking a look at this from first principles, uh, which I guess is relevant for Ethereum as well, because you're, you're in a, a similar position as, as you move towards this sort of sharding landscape. Uh, OK, the, the next thing I want to mention is uh, is content IDs. So these are the building blocks of IPFS, and they're the building blocks on which much um, much of the Web3 data is stored, NFTs. Uh, so, so this is important for Ethereum, but this is going to change pretty soon, I think, because what we have coming along is the Filecoin virtual machine. And the Filecoin virtual machine will allow uh, I interaction with storage n uh, natively, and the Filecoin virtual machine is going to be EVM compatible. So I think this could be uh, quite important. 
so th this is the ro uh, the uh, the kind of road ahead for the FEM different milestones. So there's been already a lot of progress. The FPM has been cr created and it's been running already on our minor nodes. Um, I think it's synced with the main chain just a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we expect it to be fully deployed um, by the by the end of. Uh, the autumns by the end of the year for sure uh, to be able to execute arbitrary um, user defined smart contracts on Filecoin so you'll have this combination of an e e e something like the EVM but that interacts natively with storage on Filecoin um, okay uh, and then the last thing that I wanted to mention is something that's being developed very much is a, d a data retrievability market. So of course you can retrieve data on Filecoin already, but there's a lot of work to be done to sort of sharpen this up. And I think this is going to be really relevant uh, for the sort of data retrievability um, discussions that we've been seeing earlier to try to secure rollups. Uh, so if you can post state uh, verifiably to Filecoin and easily retrieve that, I think that could potentially enable a lot of things. And this is something that's going to be talked about, I think, a lot more uh, in detail by Nicola uh, tomorrow. So just the last thing to mention, tomorrow we're having the Filecoin Crypto Econ Day. This is a very, very high level overview, but uh, tomorrow there will be a lot more technical details So, into how you actually design a gas model whenever you're in this post uh, block space scarcity era. Uh, how, how do you create a pricing model that ensures that you have storage? That can be retrieved for a very, very long time. Uh, and looking at data availability and data retrievability and these different types of things. Uh, so I think that's all I've got to say, really. So thanks very much. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. And I hope to see you, some of you, tomorrow at the Filecoin Crypto Week on Day. Cheers. Any questions? Maybe. One second. Yeah, I was curious. Um, yeah, with the protocol, I guess you don't know uh, like much about the computers that are storing the data. I guess you just, um, you know, the network will just get the data and that's it. But is there any aggregate analytics on the types of machines that are hosting um, data on file on yeah IPFS? Um, so there are analytics in terms of their geographic location and things like this, so you can ensure that it's fairly decentralized and it's not all localized within a uh, single storage provider and in one location. So you've got analytics in that sense. In terms of the, the actual like, specification of the machine that's that's running the... the yeah, I, I guess a follow-up question sort of was on that initial data you showed around how much is stored by AWS versus yes. uh, Filecoin. Um, yeah, I think it was the, maybe the first or second slide. Yeah. Um, is it possible that some of those machines that are serving data here are hosted on AWS or... or or what proportion might be. Uh, yeah, th that's entirely possible. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you, you could, you can run this on Metal and you can have your own uh, storage provider, or you can run it in a cloud service as well, if you think that's going to be uh, economical. And I know some people do that because it is somewhat technical, uh, running a mining uh, service. Um, I, I think that is economical at the minute because it's a fairly good return on investment for mining in fill-on-fill -fill terms. What, what it will be like in the future, I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any final questions? Yes. Hey. Hi, yeah. Uh, I was wondering how the the dataverse works with um, Filecoin? Because I know there's a few players in this area like Ocean, um, but mm -hmm. it makes sense for Filecoin to move into this area, especially because uh, it's stored there, right? Um, but one question sure. <laughs> would be, uh, how does it work with uh, malleable uh, metadata? So metadata that changes because um, when we try to use Filecoin, um, they like to keep the static data mm. on the Filecoin and then have the uh, metadata that can change on an NFT, for example, saved outside 
of Filecoin. So I was just wondering how that would work in the Dataverse ecosystem. Yes. Um, so I, th I think there's different elements to this. The, the two important things are probably going to be the development of the FVM, which is going to uh, allow uh, smart contracts to interact with with uh, data on IPFS much more easily. Um, um, I think in, in terms of the retrievability, this is something that's being developed in the data retrievability markets. Uh, I, I know that people are working on making sure the retrievability can happen, and it can happen much more quickly. Um, I mean, it, it seems natural that uh, Filecoin and IPFS is going to be central to 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 the dataverse. I mean, it, this is literally where most of the storage is happening. Uh, I mean, there's tons of development and ecosystem projects coming on, um, but really how all of this plays out and like w what are the consequences of having FVM, um, it, it's so difficult to say. I mean, there, there's going to be so many more business models, whether it's insurance, whether it's uh, lending games, interacting with storage. Uh, it's so hard to predict how it's going to play out, uh, but you know, it's, it's what you can make of it. All right. Thank you very much, Tom. Cheers. Thanks very much.